So um, welcome, my name is Claire Norens. I'm a clinical assistant professor here at the UGA School of Law and I direct the First Amendment Clinic. Um, our clinic represents a variety of clients in different First Amendment, media law and government transparency matters. And before joining the law school, I was in private practice representing plaintiffs on First Amendment and other constitutional claims, particularly in the areas of policing and employment discrimination. Um, I've also served as, as an assistant uh, state attorney general for the state of New York, and I worked at UGA in another capacity as assistant director of the Equal Opportunity Office before I came over to direct the clinic. Um, and I'm a board member of the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, which helped to coordinate today's training. So joining me today is Maddie Blair. She is a second year law student at the University of Georgia, and she is enrolled in the clinic this semester. Um, she's originally from Alpharetta, Georgia, and graduated from Butler University in Indianapolis before returning to Georgia for law school. Outside of her work with the clinic, Maddie is an editorial board member of the law school's Journal of Intellectual Property Law, and she worked this past summer with the United Postal Service's in-house legal department. Our third presenter today is Lindsay Floyd, who is a legal fellow in the University of Georgia School of Law's First Amendment Clinic. In this role, she represents a variety of clients on First Amendment and media law issues. Um, originally from Arizona, Lindsay graduated from the University of Colorado School of Law in May of 2021. As a law student, she interned with the American Civil Liberties Union and the Byron White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law. Um, she's worked on civil rights litigation and community education as a law student. She was also a student attorney in Colorado Law's Civil Practice Clinic, where she represented low-income individuals in employment and housing litigation. So before we jump into the content of our presentation, I'll just note that everyone is currently on mute except for the presenters. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and type it into the chat and we will address it. Um, we will also have a, a time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers um, via the chat. And finally, um, if you would like to receive um, Post council credit for attending today. Information for doing so is also being put into the chat. So we'll start with a couple of legal disclaimers. Um, so just to be clear, today's presentation provides general legal information and guidance, but it is not intended to be and does not constitute legal advice. So if you are confronted with a situation that involves um, formulating new policy or dealing with a particular factual situation that has First Amendment implications, we would encourage you to consult with the qualified counsel for your particular agency or department. Um, so with those disclaimers, I will now turn it over to Maddie to talk about the who, what, why, and where of First Amendment audits. Great. So hi, everybody. My name is Maddie Blair. As Professor Norton said, I'm a second year law student at the University of Georgia. And before we get started, I have a couple quick questions that you can answer by using the hand raise function in Zoom. First, I want to ask how many of you know what a First Amendment audit is? Cool. And how many of you have actually experienced a First Amendment audit? Great. Great, so we're just going to start with the basics of the First Amendment audit, what it is, what its application is, and how best to prepare for and deal with them. And again, as we're discussing, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. So a First Amendment audit, as defined by the official auditing website, is the practice of exercising one's constitutional right to record video for the purpose of educating anyone who attempts to infringe that right and commending those who respect it. Importantly, a successful audit is one in which the auditor is treated the same as they would be without a camera. So the main purpose of the audit is to make sure that public employees know their First Amendment rights and that they respect the rights of the auditor. So where do these audits generally end up? Normally, they'll end up online. Auditors record interactions with public officials and post videos to the internet as a form of activism. 
And since most of these auditors post their videos to YouTube and now TikTok, one of their main purposes is to generate content and subscribers. And to do this, uh, a lot of these accounts are really looking for dramatic situations. They're looking for things that will generate something they can tag a clickbait title onto, something they can create a dramatic thumbnail for, um, because more controversial content is going to generate more views and more revenue for these channels. So basically, the more controversial a situation is, the better for the auditors because it's better for their site. However, a successful audit is one in which the auditor, again, is treated the same as they would be without the presence of a camera. So why can auditors conduct these audits? The First Amendment right to record is what permits individuals to audit public officials in public places. And there are three different ways that the right to record constitutes expressive activity that is covered by the First Amendment. So first, it's a form of information or news gathering. It's a way to capture information about government employees as they carry out their job duties. Second, the act of a recording can express a message. For the auditors, this message is something like, I'm here to exercise my constitutional rights and to test you to see if you, government employees, can understand and respect my rights. And then finally, making a recording is part of the speech creation process. It's a, it's a necessary predicate for speech. Making the recording is a necessary first step in order for the auditor to then disseminate it, usually by posting it online with accompanying commentary by the auditor. So even just titling the recording, failed audit or successful audit is a form of commentary. And courts have consistently recognized the right to record. So we've got a couple standout cases here. Uh, in Garrison versus the state of Louisiana, the Supreme Court recognized a paramount public interest in a free flow of information to the per to the people concerning public officials. And similarly, the first amendment, the First Circuit has acknowledged a First Amendment right to gather information that can be easily disseminated to protect and promote the free discussion of public affairs. All this is really just to say that a growing consensus of courts has recognized a constitutional right to record government officials, especially police officers, engaged in their duties in a public place. And this quote is from an 11th Circuit case. The 11th Circuit is where Georgia sits. So it's important to note here that in the 11th Circuit, individuals have a broad right to record public officials and more specifically matters of public interest. And it does get more specific than that. So the Middle District of Georgia has also reiterated the 11th Circuit standard on the right to record. This quote is from a case called Dunn versus Fort Valley, um, where Judge Self restated the 11th Circuit standard and even noted that the right to record is a quote, pretty simple rule. So this quote really nicely summarizes First Amendment auditor protections and states the Middle District of Georgia's opinion on the rule itself, that it's simple and that it's clear. So moving into who auditors can film. So there's a difference between filming the public employee and people who are generally in the space, private individuals generally in the space. And the difference here is that auditors are allowed to film public employees in public spaces, but not in private areas. And this includes the right for an auditor to single out public employees during filming, so to film a single individual public employee. In contrast, while the auditor is allowed to record people generally while they're filming and panning around a public space, they cannot single out a member of the gen general population. Zeroing in, zeroing in on an individual patron can be intrusive. So if the auditor is engaging directly with an individual, not just recording a general interaction, then that can be classified as intrusive and is not covered by the right to record protections. So we have who auditors can record and we also have certain places where auditors can record. And in a minute, we'll also talk about the restrictions that can be imposed on the right to record in different types of areas. But generally, anyone can photograph or video record in public areas. So this includes, for example, public streets, sidewalks, parks, municipal auditoriums, and open government meetings. 
This last one is important because the Georgia Open Meetings Act specifically states that people have the right to record in an open meeting where the public has the right to be present. On the other end of the spectrum, photography and video recording may be restricted or prohibited altogether in non-public spaces. So this would include spaces in a government office that are designated and enforced as being employee only, patient care areas in government healthcare facilities, restrooms in any government buildings, government storage facilities, and hallways in public schools. So between these two extremes, we also have some gray areas, right? So this is where it's an open question whether a court would ultimately determine these spaces to be public or non-public. Examples of these gray areas include waiting rooms and front desk areas in government buildings, parking lots, and sidewalks on public school or government campuses. So we've got this overview of who and where auditors can record. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Professor Norens to talk about limitations on the right to record. Great, thank you so much, Maddie. Um, so now we are gonna talk about limitations on the right to record. And to understand those limitations, we first need to talk a little bit about uh, forum doctrine under the First Amendment, which some of you may already be a little bit familiar with. Um, so forum doctrine is a court constructed construct and it um, recognizes essentially four different kinds of forums. So we start off with traditional public forums, which are places like public streets, public sidewalks, public parks, um, government plazas, perhaps. Um, and these are spaces that for time in memoriam have been held open to the public to be able to come and speak and express themselves on any topic. So First Amendment rights, including the right to record, are the most broad in traditional public forums. Um, after that, we have what we call designated or limited public forums. So these are government spaces that maybe historically were not open to speech, but have now been designated by the government as places where people can come to express themselves. If it's a designated public forum, um, people can speak on any topic. There's no limitation. If it's a limited public forum, the government may have specified that this is a place to only speak on certain topics. Um, so, for instance, the public comment section during an open meeting um, would be an example of a limited public forum where people um, can come and perhaps talk about issues concerning the school board if it's a school board meeting. Um, so, again, these are going to be places where there are uh, substantial speech rights, but not as broad as in traditional public forums. And then we have um, non-public forums, which are places that have really not been opened up to the general public to be able to express themselves. Um, so an example of that would be, you know, private offices or employee-only spaces in a government building. That would be a non-public forum. And then we have places that really aren't forums at all. So we call those non-forums. And examples of that would be restrooms or storage facilities in government buildings. So as you can see, um, starting with traditional public forums and then moving down the spectrum to non-forums, um, we have very broad First Amendment rights, including broad rights to record um, in traditional forums and designated forums. And then as we get into limited and non-public forums and non-forums at all, those rights become more restricted. So with that background, I also wanna introduce two concepts that we call content-based restrictions and viewpoint-based restrictions. So content-based restriction refers to a government regulation on private speech that is based on the subject matter or the topic of the speech. So an example of that would be a rule that there can be no campaigning within 50 yards of a voting site of a polling place. That's a content-based restriction because it's only targeted at speech that is on the subject of campaigning. It doesn't apply to other topics of speech. Um, so this would be per permissible. It would be lawful to have such um, a rule um, in a limited and a non-public forum. And uh, so content-based is often 
permissible, but not always. Um, and then we have viewpoint-based restrictions. So viewpoint-based means that the restriction is targeting a certain perspective or viewpoint. It's not about the subject matter so much, it's about the speaker's view on that subject matter. So an example of this would be a rule that there can be no anti-abortion speech within 50 yards of an abortion clinic. That's viewpoint-based because it's not prohibiting pro-abortion speech, it's only prohibiting anti-abortion speech. So it's only targeting one perspective on a particular topic. And viewpoint-based discrimination is prohibited under the First Amendment in all forums, um, in traditional public forums, designated limited public forums, and even in non-public forums. So key takeaway, viewpoint discrimination is always prohibited. So now let's apply these concepts to the right to record. So in public areas, you know, like public streets, sidewalks, municipal auditoriums, parks. Um, the only restrictions on speech, including on the right to record that will be constitutional are gonna be reasonable time, place, manner restrictions or TPMs. And this refers to a kind of restriction that meets three criteria. First, it's gonna to have to be content neutral. So it's got to apply to all speech in that particular forum, regardless of the subject matter or content. Um, then the restriction is going to have to be narrowly tailored to serve a significant, a, excuse me, a significant governmental interest. And usually that governmental interest is going to be something like public safety or public order, um, or the ability of public employees to carry out their duties. And then thirdly, the time, place, manner restriction is going to have to leave open uh, sufficient alternative channels for the speaker to get their message across. Um, and so these criteria come from a very famous Supreme Court case called Ward versus Rock Against Racism. So in public areas, you can have reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. And let's look at what some examples of those might be. We can move to the next slide, please. Um, so examples of time, place, manner restrictions would be things like um, you can't block entrances or exits to buildings while you're engaging in your speech or expressive activity. Um, you can't block vehicular or pedestrian traffic while you're engaged in speech or expressive activity. You can't violate generally applicable laws like trespass laws or jaywalking laws or other laws that apply to the general population. Um, you cannot interfere with public employees carrying out their duties. That would be um, a reasonable time, place, manner restriction. Um, or you cannot disobey lawful police orders. So for instance, in a crowd situation, if the police are dispersing people from the area, someone engaging in First Amendment speech or activity, including exercising their right to record, is not exempted from that lawful order. They still have to comply. Um, so these are all examples of legitimate, reasonable time, place, manner restrictions that can be imposed in public spaces. And so let's just review what those public spaces would be. Um, public streets, public sidewalks, public parks, government plazas that have been opened up for speech, municipal auditoriums, um, open meetings, um, these would all be places where you can have reasonable time, place, manner restrictions, uh, but that's about it in terms of limiting First Amendment rights and the right to record. Now, when we get to non-public spaces, if we could, yep, non-public areas, there um, you can have more restrictions. Um, so you can have a restriction, including on the right to record, so long as the restriction is reasonable in light of the purpose of the forum, and the restriction is going to have to be viewpoint neutral. So for instance, if you decide, um, you know, this is a, you know, employee only area of our uh, police department and um, we're not gonna allow any, any recording in here. That's fine, you can do that, but then you have to make sure that you're enforcing it against everyone. 
So if you're not going to allow First Amendment auditors to record in this non-public space, you also can't allow news media to record in there. You can't allow um, employees and their family members to record in there unless, of course, it's a body cam situation where um, you have to have your body cam on because you're interviewing a witness or interacting with a complainant or something. Um, but you have to, you know, any restrictions that you have in these non-public areas need to be enforced across the board equitably. You can't be singling out, for instance, auditors and saying, well, you can't record, but other people can come in here and, and record because we're okay with that. Um, so take away from non-public areas, okay to have more restrictions there as long as you um, enforce them equitably and not selectively. And then we have the gray areas that Maddie mentioned where it's really kind of an open question. Are these going to be found by a court to be, um, oops, sorry, just to review really quickly, um, non-public spaces where you could have more than just time, place, manner restrictions would be employee only areas, patient care areas, if you're talking about a government healthcare facility or clinic, um, storage facilities at government locations, hallways in public schools, restrooms, um, not an exhaustive list, but those are just some examples of the, the private non-public areas. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the gray areas. So in the gray areas where it's kind of unresolved, whether it's a public space or a non-public space, um, you can always have reasonable time, place, manner restrictions that are content neutral. Um, and if you choose to go ahead and have more restrictions than that, kind of, you know, on the gamble that a court would find it to be a non-public space. You want to be sure that you've communicated to the public what those restrictions are. Um, so they're going to have to be viewpoint neutral, um, and they're going to need to be publicly posted or in some other way, people need, need to be made aware of those restrictions um, so that if they're violating them, they've had notice. Uh, and a chance to bring their conduct into comportment with those restrictions. So now we're going to move on to looking at a couple of video examples of um, an audit that maybe could have been handled a little bit better, and then a very successful audit. And we're going to talk about you know each of those and sort of unpack them. Um, and then uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about best practices for both preparing for an audit in advance and then also responding in the moment when the audit occurs and talking through some hypotheticals where you all will have a chance to sort of offer your thoughts and suggestions for how to respond. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay to take us into this next section. Thanks, Professor Norens. So yes, now we're going to watch two videos, two different videos of two examples of audits. And while we watch these videos, I would love if you would type in the chat things that you think went well and things that you wish had gone differently. So the first audit um, is a video of a failed audit conducted at Suffolk County Police Department in New York. Um, this video was taken on March 1st, 2021. And as you can see from the salacious title, it says, don't touch me, First Amendment audit fail, cop gets physical. So obviously this title is intended to be a, a clickbait title um, with the hopes of generating a lot of views. And so I'll show you two scenes from this video. The video itself is 11 minutes, so quite long. We won't watch the whole thing, but the two scenes that I'll show you are the auditor's first interaction with three plainclothes officers, and then the auditor's interaction with an additional uniformed officer, and we'll discuss what we felt went wrong after. Hey, okay. Hey, oh, don't, don't, wait, oh, don't touch me. Please don't. I don't consent to no search and seizures. I don't. I'm in public place. I don't. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, 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 because you come up here and I'm be trying to grab me. Don't grab me. Don't touch me. Don't, listen, you're a cop, de-escalate the situation. That's what you're trying to do, right? That's what you're trying to do. Whoa, whoa, whoa. De de-escalate. No, no. De-escalate. I do not, I do not consent to any searches or seizures. I haven't broken the law. Stop that. You're cornering me in a corner. You're putting me in a corner. Please, please stop. 
Please stop. I know. Look, you're pushing me into a corner. I don't want you touching me. I don't care. What is your name and badge number? You have identification. What is your name and badge number? Why are you coming up behind me? Stop. What are you guys doing? I do not feel safe. I do not feel. Okay, so that's the first interaction. Um, and about two minutes later, another officer um, attempts to intervene. So we'll watch that portion next. You guys are surrounding me? Ma'am, I don't know if these guys are cops. Can you please just protect me? Okay. Take a deep breath. And have it's, a conversation. We're how do you surround people? Sir, you Right. Okay, let's have a conversation. No problem. Nothing. I'm not doing anything. I'm. I'm. I'm I am. I am. Can I tell you what I'm doing? You want me to tell you? I'm going to answer this one question for you. Ready? I'm engaging in a First Amendment protected activity. Did you swear an oath to the Constitution, ma'am? Huh? Did you swear an oath to the Constitution? Yes. So protect me from these guys yes. and let me continue doing my constitutional right. That's it. I talked to two officers before this, and they were very nice. What am I trying to accomplish there? I'm trying whatever I want. I'm working on a story. These cop cars look cool. I want to look at them. For personal use, I'm not answering more questions. Am I being detained? Okay, so what are we doing here? Okay, so the video is 11 minutes. We won't watch the rest of it. But now if you could type in the chat things that you felt went wrong during this audit to make it a uh, first time audit fail. Or maybe put another way, what would you have maybe done differently in that situation than what we saw in the video? Um, so yeah, um, someone wrote, it would help to have context for what was happening prior to the arrival. And this is true, it would help to have that context. These first time audits are short clips in time and we don't have the context, but um, the actual interactions themselves are what, what inspire the clickbait. So knowing that this is the entire universe of the information we have available to us, I think there's some great, great suggestions. How can I help you? Introducing yourself and asking if you can help them with anything. Um, the officers followed the cameraman, giving him the impression that he was being detained or not free to go. Yeah, so I think um, one of the things is that there's three officers who initially outnumbered the auditor, and this made the auditor immediately go on the defensive uh, because the presence of the three officers escalated the situation. Um, oh, yes, someone hit hit the nail right on the head. So the officers made the auditor feel cornered, um, and one of the officers even walked around the car to, to surround him from a different angle. Um, the officers did not give their name or badge numbers, but I think most importantly, someone wrote, there are no posted, no public access signs posted that I could see. So how does the auditor, auditor know if he was in a public space or not? And this is what I want you to take away from this video. So if this was an employee only space where the auditor could not record, there were no signs indica indicating that. None of the officers told him it was a restricted space and none of the officers acknowledged his right to record. So if you and I watching this video can't tell that it's a employee only parking lot, then there needs to be a more clear signage to indicate that. Um, and then something that I wanna know is the fourth officer, so the female officer in the video did attempt to deescalate the situation and that's a really important tactic, um, but she did err by asking him what his purpose for recording was. The options are that he can either record in that area or that he can't because it's an employee only area. Um, her questioning is susceptible to viewpoint discrimination, which is blatantly unconstitutional, as Professor Norton's highlighted. So the officers can't deny his right to record based on whether or not they like the reason that he's recording. Um, but they can tell him, hey, this is not a, a the correct space to be doing this. This is a private space, but we welcome you to record in the public space on the sidewalk over there or in our lobby or wherever the public space is. And Lindsay, if I could just add, you know, if this is not an employee only parking lot or it hasn't been designated as such, um, then he does have the right to be there and to record, even if the officers don't love that he's recording their vehicles. Um, 
and they can't suddenly decide on the spot, hey, this is employee only. You know, it needs to be a designation that was made in advance and that actually is enforced. Um, and then finally, people don't have to have a reason to be recording. Like they can have a reason or no reason at all or multiple reasons. Um, and so asking him, you know, what are you hoping to achieve by recording is really not an appropriate inquiry because it doesn't matter. He he has the right to record, period, assuming it's not an employee-only lot. Great. So um, just to let you know what happened, after these clips, the auditor complies with their orders to lift his sweatshirt to confirm that he has no weapons on him. Four or more officers drive by in two separate vehicles, and the initial three officers leave the parking lot. Um, the auditor continues to record, and eventually all officers leave the parking lot. And then in the description of the video, the auditor notes that he filed a complaint against the first officer to respond. So um, the officer in the gray sweatshirt here. So this next video is... Sorry. <laughs> this next video is an example of a good or past audit conducted here in Georgia. So this video was recorded in July 2021 in Milledgeville, Georgia, and the title is The First Amendment Audit Pass, Milledgeville, Georgia Police Department. This is what we want from our law enforcement office. So this video is shorter than the first video, and I will play it for you now. Here, that's where the cowboy has to be. Here. How are you? This is more up to date. Okay. That's probably 2000s, judging by the air. How are you, sir? Hey, what year do you think that is right there? What year do you think that is? I'll say yes, 2000 due to her hair. Yeah. Okay. So, what was your name, badge number, sir? Uh, Brooks, number 42. Okay, you've been very, very professional. Okay, how did I get an officer complaint form? Does that go through here? Well, look at that. I do like that. Today? Yes, ma'am. Just uh, wandering around looking around. They said there's another uh, complex on 441, like an annex building for the courthouse. Oh, oh no. Yes, sir. You scribe already. Hey, they got you Yes, sir. Yeah, I appreciate it. Are you working here? I appreciate it. I'm doing by her hair, and I said 2000. And he, and he said maybe a little bit older. This one is probably, uh, probably 90. Okay. You in there? Oh, no, no, wait for me. She's still here. There's a few of them that are still here. Oh, wow. And that's our current chief is over there now. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, that's probably 90s, early 90s. How about that? And this is older. I mean, this is 50 or 60. Yeah, these, these are way older. These are way older. That is really cool. Well, cool, man. Maybe see you look good. I appreciate you yeah, so much. Right. They got the same us? Yes, sir. That's all I needed, man. You did, man. All right. And that's the Millville, Georgia police station. Sorry for the shorty, but I'm going to tell you, that's what you want. Less than a minute. Okay. So in this clip, the auditor also interacts with four employees, but with significantly different results. So what do you feel went well with this audit? I'll give everyone a moment to type in the chat. 
Yes, they ignored the camera and treated him like anyone else. That's a great answer. So if by definition, a successful audit is one in which the auditor is treated the same as they would be without a camera, this is the perfect example of that. Um, the officer's conversation was consensual, yeah. Um, he wasn't confrontational and he talked to the auditor because the auditor wanted to talk to the officer. Everyone was kind and courteous. Um, no one asked him why he was reporting. No one asked him for identification. Anything else in the chat? So I also want to point out that the employee handed him the officer complaint form without asking questions. And it's really important that the employee in charge of complaint forms just gives them the complaint form without asking them um, why they need the complaint form. Obviously, if, if the person asks to speak with someone um, from the police department, that's a different situation. But all he asked for was the complaint form. And then also the officers gave their names and badge numbers without confrontation and without hesitation. So this is um, a really good example in Milledgeville of a, a good audit. But I do want to note that it is important to engage with the auditor pursuant to open records laws. So if an auditor asks for a complaint form or another public record, it's important that you engage with them long enough to give them that record. But you don't have to stop your business to answer other superfluous questions. So it was really nice that the officers stopped to discuss like when that photo was taken, but they didn't have to do that. It did make the interaction easier though, and then the op and then the auditor left quicker. So it's up to you as long as you're answering the questions that are within your duty to answer. You don't really have to make small talk, but often small talk makes these interactions more pleasant, um, and then they're over quicker. So I also want to point out that the auditor briefly panned the lobby and captured a member of public on film. And so this is allowed pursuant to the auditor's right to record. You notice that he did not single out that individual um, and they took that individual back into an employee only area. So the auditor didn't have a right to film him beyond that point. Um, so the last big takeaway that I want you to digest here is the difference in views between the two videos. So the first video, the purported fail video, has 369,000 views on YouTube. And then this video, the past, has one one hundredth of those views. It only has 3,600 views. So even accounting for a different number of subscribers, it's clear that the videos with the most views are the so-called audit fails, the ones where the auditors help escalate the situation in some way or blatantly violate the auditor's rights. That's what the purpose of these audits are. So if you can de-escalate the situation, if you can acknowledge their right, and if you can do everything that you're supposed to do, typically these audits are not as highly consumed. So this is why it's really important to stay level-headed and understand how best to respond to a situation. Lindsay, before you move on, can we just circle back to two questions that were in the chat? Um, so one person asked, what about off-duty police officers? Can the auditor single them out? Um, so keep in mind that the right to record is um, mostly about recording public officials carrying out their official duties. So if the officer is off-duty, he's presumably not doing his official police duties, and therefore it would not be okay to single him out. Um, the next question was, what about within a GDC guideline or inmates working on outside details? So um, inmates are not considered public officials or public employees. So it would be fine to, you know, pan the street or the sidewalk or, you know, the outdoor public area where the inmates are working. Um, but it would not be okay to zero in on any particular inmate to scrutinize um, what they're doing. Great. Okay, so let's, let's talk about how to prepare for and how to respond to these audits. So how to prepare for a First Amendment audit. Well, first you wanna educate employees on the First Amendment right to record and the Georgia open records. So you are as strong as your least educated employee. It is imperative that everyone in your agency really understands the auditor's rights, so that you have consistent application of the rules. 
Auditors routinely make records requests and ask for public records. And so it's really important that your employees know how to respond uh, correctly. These uh, resources up in the top left corner, uh, we have a blue book here for law enforcement records specifically, and then the red book for public records more generally. Those are both available on the Georgia First Amendment Foundation website, and they provide really in-depth um, information about Georgia's open record laws and how you can best comply with them. So second, we would suggest that you adopt a right to record standard operating procedure. Atlanta Police Department has a beautiful SOP that we will look at in a moment that acknowledges the right to record. And yes, Kathy Brister is dropping links to the blue book and the red book in the chat right now um, if you're interested in looking at those. You also should train employees on the SOP and how to appropriately respond to First Amendment audits. Again, you want to eliminate any chance of discrimination so that all of your employees can respond consistently to audits. So training is really important to that goal. You should be using signage to distinguish between public areas versus employee only or restricted areas. So like we discussed before, auditors need to know what the areas that they are and are not allowed to film in. And having signage to distinguish between these areas is going to help as you, as you enforce those rules. Um, People don't automatically know what's a public area versus a not public area, unless of course it's behind like a locked door. Um, so it's really important that you're using signage to indicate what's an employee only space um, versus what isn't. And then lastly, determine in advance who will talk to the auditor if the auditor is going beyond what the right to record protects. So if you have an auditor who is trying to film in employee only areas or an auditor who is singling out members of the public, um, it's really important that you have someone who's designated um, in advance to respond to an auditor if the auditor is going past his or her rights. I presume that all of you are really brilliant at de-escalating situations, but the person that you have assigned to this duty should be someone who is who has a firm understanding of the law, is patient, and can de-escalate the situation. So here is Atlanta Police Department's um, standard operating procedure. So it acknowledges the right to record and expressly states in the first bullet point that all employees shall be prohibited from interfering with a citizen's right to record police activity by photographic, video, or audio means. The SOP even goes so far as to say that interfering with the right to record is a dismissible offense. And so the SOP can include limitations as long as they are constitutionally sound, but all officers in the Atlanta Police Department understand that the right to record is a right that citizens have because of this SOP. So now how to respond to a First Amendment audit, whether you yourself are responding to an audit um, on police property, or if you are dispatched, dispatched to an agency where an auditor is present, you need to keep in mind that these are the best practices for how to respond to a First Amendment audit. So you should introduce yourself and acknowledge the right to record. We had a lot of people earlier who suggested that the, what they would do differently in the like failed audit situation is that they would first introduce themselves and ask, how can I help you? And I think that's a really great way to start. Um, you want to provide name and badge number if asked. You do not ask for the auditor's name or ID unless you have probable cause that they are violating the law and recording itself is not violating the law. Um, you would wanna request that the auditor focus on recording employees, not private citizens, if there is a concern that they are making citizens uncomfortable. So employees may be uncomfortable, but auditor still has the right to record them carrying out their duties in a public space. And again, employees are not required to engage in conversation initiated by the auditor, but doing so may help de-escalate the situation. You want to explain any applicable time, place, and manner restrictions, if not already in compliance. And you do not want to put your hand over a camera. So putting your hand over a camera like this violates the right to record, even if you're not physically taking the camera away from them or detaining them. And then you also, lastly, do not want to delete or destroy recordings. So now that you have a better understanding of how to prepare and how to respond, let's look at some examples. And if you would please write in the chat how you think you would want to respond. So example one, while filming inside of a police precinct, an auditor tries to enter a restricted area that is for employees only. How would you want to respond? And I'll give you a second to type.
Yes. I think saying, excuse me, can I help you is good. Um, definitely approaching the auditor to ask if there's something that they need. Maybe they don't realize it's a uh, restricted area. Yes, directing back them, directing them back to a public area. So I love this answer. It says explain they are entering a restricted area and direct them back to a public area. So you're not asking them to stop recording, you're asking them to record within their rights. And so their rights do not include recording within a restricted area. So you can direct them back to a public area and allow them to record there. Yes. And someone also pointed out that it should be posted that way, that it's an employee only area. So Again, an auditor might not know that it's a restricted area, which is why signage is so important to designating these spaces. Great, I think you all got it. Yes, we have acknowledged the auditor's right to record and let them know that it does not extend to employee only areas and have a sign designating employees only areas from those open to the public. Okay, so our next example is, you have been dispatched to the public library in response to a call that an auditor is filming the patrons reading. The librarian tells you that it is making both the patrons and the staff uncomfortable. How do you handle the situation? Yes, so someone wrote, was the person asked to leave? So I guess in this presumption, we're assuming that the librarians called in you to respond uh, to the situation. So it would be your call on whether or not you're going to ask the person to leave. I think before you do that, though, there's some other good options. Um, someone wrote, remind them that they, although they have a right to film in a public area, they cannot point out a certain person. Um, yeah, so someone said, recognize their right to record in a public space, but tell them that it's not to who record citizens. So yes, they can't single out um, anyone, but they can pan general library areas that contain other people. You should also inform the library staff that the auditor has the right to record both employees working and people in the public areas so that they don't, as long as they don't single out individual patrons. And you should see for yourself why the staff feels uncomfortable. Short of harassment, an auditor has the right to be there recording the public employees doing their public duties. So let's see, I think we hit all of them. So inform library staff that auditor has the right to record, um, but can't single out individual patrons. Do not ask the auditor to stop recording, but remind them that they cannot single out individual patrons and panning the room where people are reading is fine. So I think these are all great first steps on how to handle an audit that you've been called to. So this last example is really similar to the audit that we watched earlier. So let's see if we can, how we would handle this situation. So you notice that an auditor is in the police parking lot filming police and private vehicles, including license plates. How do you respond? Yeah, great identification. You can definitely do nothing. As long as the auditor isn't violating any time, place, or manner restrictions, they have a right to be there. Um, so definitely, I would say one of the best suggestions is to just do nothing. Yes. So if there's no established signs of restrictions, then they have a right to be there. Um, and if a lot has a sign designating it as employee only, and this is actually an enforced restriction, then you can politely introduce yourself to the auditor and um, acknowledge that they have the right to record in public spaces, point out that the law says employee only, and ask the auditor to move to a public space to continue filming. So this would include right, a sidewalk on the outside of the lot. Um, so they can move to the sidewalk adjacent to the lot if it's an employee only lot that you have designated as such. So yeah. Y'all answered really well, and I think we hit all of the points, so good job. Now I'm going to turn it back to Professor Norens. Um, oh, okay, well, we have a question real quick. It says, I have seen audits where first time auditors sit on cars. This is in a public space where recording could be allowed, but the assertion is that the vehicle was a government vehicle, so it belonged to the public. So 
So I'm going to presume that you are allowed to ask an auditor to get off the car. Um, you know, they're allowed to record, you know, reasonably um, public officials doing their public duties, but I don't think that extends to them actually like touching and or potentially harming your vehicle. Um, and obviously sitting on a car can do that. So I definitely think you can ask them to get off the car. Do you have anything else to add, Professor Norton, to that? No, I would agree. The right to record doesn't extend to uh, sitting on the car. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also just wanted to circle back. So with respect to filming um, like detainees or prisoners who are on work detail, um, there is a Georgia statute 42-5-17 called loitering near inmates after being ordered to desist that says that it's unlawful for someone to uh, hang around, you know, loaf, linger, or stand around uh, where inmates are being employed after being um, ordered to um, desist from doing that. And so this would be an example of a generally applicable law that would also apply to a First Amendment auditor. So if an auditor is recording and the guard or whoever's in charge of the scene says, you know, you need to move along, we don't want you to be filming our detainees here, um, the auditor would need to comply with that generally applicable law. So thank you for pointing out that statute. I wasn't aware of that one. Um, okay, so moving on to when First Amendment audits go wrong. Um, this is the last section of our presentation, and it's just important to take a moment to um, reflect on what can happen in terms of lawsuits and litigation, um, just to give you a sense of the stakes that are involved. So we have here um, a list of some of the right to record cases in Georgia, if we could move to the next slide. And so these cases are examples of how not to handle situations where people are um, photographing or recording um, public officials carrying out their duties in public places. And so I wanna talk about just a couple of them. Um, so in the Cop Watch case from 2011, this involved a citizen who was videoing an arrest by police and police told the plaintiff that he was not permitted to record them, despite the fact that all parties involved were in a public place. And the police ultimately confiscated the plaintiff's phone that he was using to record. And so this, there was a lawsuit filed and this case settled out of court with the city of Atlanta paying $40,000 um, to settle that case. In another case, Dunn versus Fort Valley, um, a citizen who identified as a citizen journalist was photographing and video recording in the lobby of the Fort Valley City Hall when he was reported by staff as being a suspicious person. And law enforcement was called and when they arrived, they told Mr. Dunn that he could not record in the lobby, even though there were no signs or any notice posted about restrictions on recording in this presumably public space. And so Mr. Dunn was arrested, his camera was confiscated, he was cited for criminal trespass, and he was barred from entering City Hall in the future. And the city of Fort Valley also refused to reply to Mr. Dunn's open records requests where he was trying to get information about his arrest. So pretty much everything that could go wrong did go wrong in this situation. And not unsurprisingly, um, this case settled and it was for quite a bit of money for $100,000. Uh, Mr. Dunn had another case against the city of Marshallville um, where he was again, um, cited for recording um, public officials in a public space, and that case also settled for $95,000. Um, so these can be you know, significant money cases. And then uh, we do have in this list of cases, one where the arrest of the person who was photographing um, was found to be justified. Um, so in the Ruck case, the 11th Circuit found there was arguable probable cause to arrest the journalist who was photographing other people's arrests on a public street. Um, and the court based its finding on the fact that the journalist had briefly stepped into the street to photograph 
and he was in an area where police were dispersing people from the area. And so therefore the court said there was arguable probable cause that he was interfering with traffic flow and impeding or obstructing the officers in their duties. Um, so not all cases go the way of the recorder, but many of them do. Um, and so we just wanted you to be aware that, you know, properly handling these audits, de-escalating, um, trying to really accommodate the right to record wherever you can um, is really the best way to prevent um, complaints and litigation that can be time consuming and costly um, for the individuals involved and for the cities and counties involved. So that brings us to the end of our presentation and we now have a bit of time if folks have other questions they'd like to put into the chat. You can also unmute yourself, um, but just keep in mind that this is being recorded. So you can also put it in the chat if you would like. So we have recorded this and it'll be posted um, on the Georgia First Amendment Foundation's YouTube channel, and we can um, provide a link to that for those who would like to review this or share it with other folks from your agency. Um, we're also happy to um, do trainings like this or presentations like this upon request. You know, if folks in your city or county are interested, be they law enforcement or other public employees, um, because police officers aren't the only ones who, you know, find themselves sometimes faced with litigation. It, it could be a librarian or another public employee who um, interfered with the right to record who could um, find themselves uh, in a defense position. So please reach out to us if, if you'd like to schedule a, a training for folks from your area or agency. I think we have some questions in the chat. Okay. Um, so someone asked the singling out of a person, what is the law court ruling that puts restrictions on filming a person in public? So it just really um, comes down to the right to record extends to uh, recording public employees carrying out their duties in public. And therefore, if you are singling out a private person who's, you know, just going about their business, um, that can become a form of harassment. Um, now, you know, if they're in a place where there's no expectation of privacy, you know, if they're just walking down the sidewalk or um, sitting in a restaurant or in a lobby of a government building, you know, waiting to be called up for their appointment, there's really no, you know, reasonable expectation of privacy in those spaces. So public or private citizens can be recorded in terms of they can be captured as part of the general scene. Um, but it's not appropriate for the auditor to go up and start questioning the private person or sort of trailing the private person uh, because that really just becomes intimidating and harassing. Um, and then it says, hate to beat a dead horse, um, but a follow-up question on the 1A auditor sitting on cars. What action do you believe would be available to officers if the auditor refused to stop sitting on cars? So you all would know better than me whether sitting on um, someone else's car without permission is a violation of the law. Um, so I think, you know, you have, you know, the right to enforce the law as you understand it. Um, but I think if the person, you know, refused to get off, you have to let them know, okay, you're now refusing a lawful police order. Um, you know, our next step would be to, you know, trespass you from this location or arrest you. We'd really prefer not to do that. Can you just please get off the car and continue exercising your right to record, um, respecting the boundaries of that right? 
Um, and of course, if they still continue to not comply, you, you have to do what you're trained to do. Um, and then someone wrote, have you seen first summit auditors using drones or remote cameras during audits? So that's a great question. Um, typically audits are conducted by people using cell phone cameras or other sort of handheld devices, or maybe they have a camera in their pocket or something. Um, you know, there's a lot of different regulations and laws that govern use of drones, and um, this presentation is not equipped to sort of go through all of those laws because there can be federal laws, state laws, and also local laws on drone usage. Um, so I think uh, that's a very fact-specific question that we would need to do some re research on, but typically your sort of garden variety auditor is not going to be using a drone. The other issue with drones is that um, they sometimes can have access to spaces that are definitely not public. Like if someone's using a drone to film inside someone's bedroom through the window, you know, that's that's gonna be a violation because that's a private space with a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and so there's no right to record to fly your drone up to someone's bedroom window and start filming them. Yeah, someone said if you're interested in drones, or if you're interested in you know the answer with drones, check out the FAA laws and city codes. All great questions. Thank you. Well, I think um, if we're out of questions, we will adjourn for today, but want to thank you for your time and please reach out to us if we can be of assistance um, and we will send you the link for the recording of today in case you want to review it or share it with others.